now I want to uh, introduce the president of the Brookings Institution, John Allen. Uh, John will moderate a panel of Brookings experts. Over to you, John. Carol, thank you. Dr. Nuzzo, thank you very much. I want to sincerely uh, express our gratitude as an institution for a terrific assessment of the current environment uh, with respect to uh, COVID-19 and the fight that we're all waging to stay healthy and to get past this uh, pandemic. You've really set the conditions and the stage very well today for our conversation. And I want to thank you and thank all of your colleagues uh, for what you do every single day to keep us safe in this world. And Daryl, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, organizing this panel, but also for your leadership in support of this project, the reopening of America and the world. We couldn't have done it without you. And I want to thank you for that. So ladies and gentlemen, as noted, I'm John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. And it is our great privilege to have you with us today uh, for this panel. Before we get started, I wanted to address something head on. These are not ordinary times. They're very difficult times. Between COVID-19, a severe recession, and the outrage stemming from the killings of George Floyd uh, and Ahmed uh, Arbery, and the other recent incidents, this moment has exposed for all of us to see the fault lines of our society and the inequality gap. And most certainly, the persistence of systemic racism in America today. Now, yesterday at Brookings, I led a moment of silence uh, for the institution. And I know in this panel today, many of the issues that have generated the pain across America will come up in our discussion. So before we start the panel today, I would ask you to join me to reflect for a moment in a moment of silence. The deaths of those black men and women of our population, our American citizens who've been harassed, who've been assaulted, and who've been killed simply for the color of their skin. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you very much. Now, turning to today's discussion, put simply, the Brookings reopening of America and the world effort represents our premier contribution at this moment to this crisis. It's as deep as it is wide, and we're very proud of all of the excellent analysis and the hard work that went into its production and its launch. In the coming months, Brookings will also contribute a substantial effort looking at a blueprint for long-term recovery and renewal of our societies as we come to grips with the long-term implications of COVID-19 and the, the difficulties of the economic recovery. These issues are central to saving many lives and the livelihoods of our people, of our population, and in the world. And we hope that we find, that you find, that this was as useful for your local communities uh, as it was for us to produce uh, for the general population. But most importantly, we hope that you remain safe and well throughout these challenging times. For today, however, we have five leading experts from within the Brookings Institution uh, who were major contributors to the reopening effort. And sadly, I don't have enough time to spend the, the time I should uh, on their backgrounds. So it'll be a very brief introduction, but I'm very honored to be with them today. And the first is Molly Kinder who's a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program, and Rashawn Ray, also a David M. Rubenstein Fellow uh, with our Governance Studies Program, Ross Hammond, who's a Senior Fellow and the Director of our Center on Social Dynamics and Policy and Economic Studies Program, David Wessel, a Senior Fellow and Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy in the Economic Studies Program, and last but certainly not least, Bill Galston, Senior Fellow and Ezra K. Zilka Chair in our Governance Study Program. Colleagues, it's great to see you and welcome to the panel this afternoon. So with that, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, as a final reminder, we are live and obviously on the record. Uh, and we'll be turning to Q&A following our discussion in, the, in a few moments. And you can submit questions by emailing them to events at brookings.edu. That's events.brookings at brookings.edu 
or via Twitter using hashtag COVID reopening, hashtag COVID reopening. Indeed, some of you have already submitted some questions. We're very grateful for those. And time allowing, we'll get to as many as we can. So let's get started. <clears throat> the first question is for the whole panel. Uh, beginning first with Georgia, uh, regional reopenings have commenced across the country. As Dr. Nuzzo said, we've seen some mixed successes. Uh, even Washington, D.C. has started, with phase one beginning last Friday. So here's the question. Are we genuinely ready to reopen? And recognizing the inevitability of the reopening efforts, what do you think are the lessons learned from our COVID experience so far, uh, as well as responses that we have seen and studied from overseas? And uh, Molly, let me start with you, if we can, and we'll just go straight through the panel, please. Sure. Thanks, John, and thanks so much for having me in this great discussion. Uh, my research has really focused on the essential workers, the millions of workers who've carried on working throughout this pandemic. And when we look at their experience, it really serves as a cautionary tale for reopening, to bringing more workers back to their jobs. And this is really revealed both in the data and the experiences of those workers. When we look at the numbers, just the sheer number of deaths amongst essential workers, whether transit workers, nursing home workers, grocery workers, it really is astonishing. And, um, and we see outbreaks, the meatpacking industry, for instance, it's really been shocking and unacceptable, the extent to which essential workers are perishing from this pandemic. And when we look at some of the survey data, it reveals that workers are really, they don't have the protective equipment they need. So as recently as early May, a survey showed that upwards of two thirds of frontline health workers had insufficient PPE. Some really fascinating uh, survey data out of Berkeley showed highly uneven basic safeguards amongst frontline workers across industries and often terribly inadequate standards. And we see that workers are frustrated. They're demanding more. The spike in workers with protests and walkouts, urgent letters from doctors and nurses pleading the federal government to, to do more in PPE. Um, but for me, what's really hit home is not even just the numbers. It's the stories from the workers themselves who are putting themselves and their families at risk as they work. Um, I've had the great privilege of interviewing about two dozen essential workers since the start of the pandemic, from grocery cashiers to nurses, um, gig workers delivering groceries and meals, um, hospital workers, cooks and cleaners and nursing homes. And I would describe the two strongest emotions I've heard are both fear and frustration. Fear because they genuinely believe that the jobs that they were doing two and a half months ago that weren't really a risk as much to themselves suddenly pose a real risk to their safety. They use words with me like petrified and terrified of their risk. Most importantly, the workers I interviewed felt most concerned not about their own um, safety, but the safety of their families, because this is something you bring home to the people you live with. And it came up pretty frequently that, that some of these workers lived with family members with underlying health conditions, and it was making them petrified that they were going to come home and cause harm to their family. And then coupled with that was frustration. A lot of workers really felt that their employers simply weren't doing enough to keep them safe. Um, especially in the health sector, lots of frustration around inadequate access to PPE, being asked to prolong use of PPE well past when it's safe. Um, and really what was striking to me was some workers I interviewed had no access to PPE from their employers, whether home health workers who were taking care of our society's most vulnerable or many of the gig workers got nothing at all from their employers. So I really think these last two and a half months are a cautionary tale. Um, I don't feel that the federal government has really done enough to, to ensure that we have enforceable standards in workplaces and that we have sufficient supplies of the life-saving protective equipment that we need. Molly, thank you. Uh, look, we're all very grateful for the research you've done in this regard. You have really highlighted uh, the, the role of the essential workers to all of us, but you've also uh, highlighted the casualties that they have endured in bringing those essential roles to us all. Thank you very much for that research. Uh, David, let me go to you, please, if uh, you have some thoughts on this. Sure. Um, I think the short answer to your question is we don't really know whether it's safe to reopen. Uh, we are running a grand experiment. Uh, I'm concerned that we're not ready because we didn't adequately provide testing and we didn't adequately instruct people on what they're supposed to be doing. It seems like a chaos and cacophony. 
Um, but I'm also struck, as you mentioned in your introductory remarks, John, about what a jarring moment this is. As you pointed out, we're in phase one of reopening in the district, yet today we face a curfew at 7 p.m. So it's very difficult to, for me to separate how we reopen the economy as we try and conquer COVID at the same time when so much unrest is going on in the cities and how difficult a moment is in our country. And so the conversation we have today is even more complicated and difficult than the one we would have had just a couple of weeks ago. So my short answer is we're not ready, but I think that largely this will be determined not by government policy, but what people choose to do. The evidence is that in many communities, people started to self-quarantine even before the governments uh, asked them to. And we'll have to see how Americans and others react to the news. If there's an uptick in the virus, will people be afraid to go out again? Or will they think of themselves in, as invincible and just get tired of sitting at home and participating in Zoom meetings or playing board games with their kids? David, thank you. You've highlighted the complexity of the moment. It is as difficult as it can be in the context of a pandemic. But when you add in the difficulties we're facing socially right now, it's, it's almost more complex than we can imagine. Uh, Rashawn, if I could ask uh, you next to join us, you have been a very powerful voice uh, to this point, uh, especially helping us all to understand the issues of inequality and how it has struck uh, our underprivileged and underserved and vulnerable segments of the population. Could I ask you to come in on this, please? Yeah, well, General Island, thank you. Um, I just want to echo what, uh, what we just heard from Molly and David. I think their statements really capture what's happening. And I think as I think about curfews, and even in Washington, D.C., the fact that this curfew is going to be going to effect at 7 p.m., I worry about these essential workers that Molly highlights, because I think at times we think that people oftentimes simply have the ability to stay in, that people have the ability to social distance. But my research highlights that social distancing is a privilege. And I think adhering to curfews is the same way. And I think about the combination of social distancing violations like we're seeing in New York City where 80 to 90% of the sanctions given out and arrest are, for, are on Black and Latinos who live in the city. Individuals who are oftentimes working as essential workers, where they can no longer use public transit during a curfew. And I think that's an unintended consequence of a curfew that we need to think about. I mean, I think in short, are we ready to reopen? No, I don't think so. And I think oftentimes it's not a, a catch-all. It's not necessarily a one thing fit all. As I know, being from Tennessee, is that they're dealing with different pressures and different sort of issues than we might be dealing with in Washington, D.C., or where my children were born, which was in Oakland, California. I think these are all playing out in different dynamics. So location matters. Even within a specific location, place matters. So we have to look at zip code. One thing that we know is zip code is highly correlated with people's social class and their racial background. So in that regard, one side of the city, say in Washington, D.C., the western side of the city might actually be far more prepared than the eastern side of the city. And we all know the way that race and class plays out there. I worry about a few specific things as well. I worry about health capacity. So not just healthcare access, but I also worry about healthcare quality, which I'll, I'll say something about later. But then I also worry about our infrastructure capacity. I worry about schools. I worry about public transit. Um, I sit on a school board and one of the discussions we were having were all of the changes that the school was going to have to make. They're going to have to purchase a whole bunch of equipment that's going to cost a lot of money. They're going to have to purchase new places for kids to wash their hands, to try to get water. They're changing around things and they're purchasing all this PPE. To Molly's point, I'm worried about the ways that we're implementing these PPP rules and guidelines without properly training people to do it. So as the, the spouse of a person who's a healthcare provider, I hear my wife talking about these sort of things all the time. I think the final point is this. I also worry about how during this moment, we seem to be setting new rules for our democracy. And I think it's highly problematic for everyone in this particular moment, that it almost seems to be the wild, wild west in some regards in the ways that these sort of policies are being laid out. And I think it comes down to a comprehensive analysis on pandemic response and preparedness that Johns Hopkins led. That study found of 195 countries that the United States ranked number one in finances, but 175th out of 195 when it came to healthcare access. 
I think that speaks to what we're talking about. And the report noted that there is no evidence that the United States is engaged in an exercise to identify a list of gaps in best practices. And oftentimes these gaps and lack of best practices collide on the bodies of our most vulnerable and oppressed citizens, whether that be by race, Blacks, Latinos, and also by income. So I think what we have to do in reopening is to really reimagine ourselves, reimagine what it looks like. And as a person who studies racial and social inequality, I hope that in this moment, we can reimagine a country where racism and inequality do not determine how much healthcare access people ha have and how, long and how long they live and whether or not their lives matter during a pandemic. John, thank you very much. Your voice, as I said at the beginning, is very powerful in these matters, helping us to understand the, the facets of the inequality uh, that you've pointed out so powerfully for us. So thank you for that. Let me uh, go to Ross, Ross Hammond. Uh, you've done a lot of work statistically on this, these matters. What are your thoughts, please? Ross, you're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, from an epidemiological perspective, as we heard Dr. Duzo speak to, reopening risks renewed spread of the epidemic. And I think there's wide variation in how ready different parts of the United States are uh, to detect, to respond to, and to control that kind of renewed spread that is likely to occur as we release lockdown and other social distancing measures. Um, from our response so far, we can see here in the United States how costly the mass shutdowns that we've all experienced are uh, for our economy, for our society, and even for our health, um, even when they are effective in controlling the spread of COVID-19. But from the responses of those overseas, we can see alternative measures we might consider here for controlling the spread of disease. Uh, we heard South Korea mentioned, but there are many other countries that have done a great job in using these alternative strategies, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, there's a long list actually of such places. The question then becomes what would it take to use those strategies here in the United States? That's a subject I've done a lot of research on that I hope we will talk more about later. One thing I wanna just highlight here in this moment of renewed attention to inequality here in the US is that almost all of these measures rely fundamentally on asking people who have COVID-19, who are contagious, to self-isolate, to be in quarantine. And for some of America, that's relatively easy to do, but for some, it's really not easy to do. And a critical policy point will actually be to facilitate uh, those who need to stay home doing so. Uh, and I think we've so far not done a great job of discussing uh, how important that is or what we need to do specifically to make that possible. Thank you, Ross. And again, you point to the complexity and how many different countries have have handled it, but also the complexity in the home. Uh, and this is going to be an area uh, we look forward to your additional comments later on this, on this very issue. Finally, uh, Bill Galston. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, I came in with a long list. And as my colleagues spoke, I started checking off items that they had discussed much better than I could. So let me just tell you very briefly what I have left. Uh, to your first, you know, to the framing of the question, I agree with just about everybody. We're not ready. We're not as ready as we should be. We're not as ready as we could have been, but we have to face facts. We are reopening. And so the practical question is how to do so as safely, carefully, and prudently as possible. I've been spending a lot of time looking around the world as Ross and others have, and here are a few things that I've learned, some of them good news, some of them not such good news. Uh, first, a couple of pieces of good news. Number one, a number of European countries have reopened their public schools, some for as long as six weeks already. And these countries had not experienced the infection spike that might have been expected and that some predicted. And that's really important because schools are gonna be a really important choke point for the reopening of the economy and normal social life. Put simply, if, if parents can't send their kids to school, most of them are gonna to, going to have to stay at home with their kids, especially women, but not only women. 
Uh, and so this is an important piece of good news. The second piece of good news is that, and this is intuitive rather than counterintuitive, uh, it is a lot safer to reopen outdoors activities than indoor activities. And so for all you golf, golf players, uh, you're in luck. But in general, uh, it's, I think it's pretty safe to reopen public, public parks, national parks, monuments, and things, of, and things of that sort. Obviously, we can't behave just the way we behaved before. But for Americans looking for a respite, you know, from sheltering in place, I think that is going to be a first resort, not, not a last resort. Now for a few pieces of bad news. First, countries around the world, regardless of their strategies, have done a very poor job of ministering to the special vulnerabilities of the elderly. This is true, as we heard from Dr. Nuzzo in the United States, where you know, the death toll in nursing homes is anywhere from 25 to 28,000 out of the 105,000 total. Uh, and this is not just the patients, but also the people working in them. You know, this, is, this problem is so clear and present. We've got to deal with it up front. We can't be business as usual when it comes to those spots. Uh, secondly, multi-generational households. Right? We've, we've learned from Italy, you know, what's characteristic of Italy is not just that it has uh, a very old population by global standards, but also that Italians are more likely than just about any country on earth to live in multi-generational families, which has imposed special vulnerabilities on the elderly and special responsibilities on their children and grandchildren. We'd better think very hard about that. And a final point, epidemiologists around the world uh, have pointed out, you know, both anecdotally and statistically, that there are certain underlying health conditions that are especially likely to lead to the severe severity of COVID-19 and to death from COVID-19. Among the leading ones, asthma, heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. Those are the big four. Uh, and as we open up everything, including our workplaces, we ought to create some sort of diagnostic and sorting mechanisms so that, uh, you know, so that workers with the one or more of these underlying conditions, which are not evenly distributed on racial and ethnic grounds, as Rashawn and others have pointed out, uh, that they can be, that they can be uh, given special treatment and if necessary, exemption from the workplace as long as the COVID-19 pandemic rages. So that's what I've gleaned so far, but more to come. Bill, thank you. And you've touched on a lot of the complexities and you've given us a lot to, to think about, especially on the, the, the health conditions, which are indicators of vulnerability. So thank you for that. Let me ask a second question for all of the panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, on Sunday, the 24th of May, the New York Times paid a very powerful tribute to the lives lost to COVID-19. I think we've all seen the lead page of that newspaper. Uh, while, newspaper while the newspaper and while others are entreating us to remember the lives of all of those that have been lost as individuals, it also encourages us to curb the continual loss of lives as we go forward. 5,000 dead, many more ill. We've got a long way to go before, as Dr. Nuzzo said, we're going to get around the containment and the movement towards a therapeutic or a vaccine. So we have to take steps on our own. Now, in the context of this question, let me ask each of you, given the specialness of your research, to give me some thoughts, please, on what are the primary challenges that we face in ensuring that this country and move towards reopening, again, within the context of your research. And then we'll go to individual questions after this, please. And Bill, let's come right back to you. Wow. <laughs> caught, me by, caught me by surprise. Well, I work, I work hard on various social policy issues. And 
let me just give you a handful of points that stand out to me. You know, what do we need to do? Number one, we need specific, enforceable workplace safety standards. We don't have them. Uh, OSHA has been largely asleep at the wheel. Uh, and we need a national effort, which may be legislative, uh, probably should be, as a matter of fact, for specific and enforceable work, workforce sta workplace standards. Workers should not be forced by economic necessity to return to unsafe, work, uh, unsafe workplaces, period, full stop. And I, I feel that very strongly. Number two, workers who are sick should not have to choose between coming to work sick and, you know, and being able to support their families. We need a program of paid sick leave and it ought to be universal. Again, uh, again, period, full stop. Uh, third, uh, in order for parts of our economy like restaurants to reopen, we're gonna need rapid results on the spot testing at the threshold of those establishments for workers and potential customers. I can tell you, I am not gonna die for a sit down meal out of my home. Uh, and as, as I read the survey research, most Americans aren't willing to do so either. But if, if, but if you tell me that a, a test has been administered on the spot with results in 10 minutes, which is how long you usually stand on a restaurant line anyway, uh, and everybody in the establishment is tested negative, I think I'd probably be willing to take that chance, but not, not otherwise. Uh, uh, we obviously have starved our system of public health for 30 years. We need to rebuild it. Uh, and two measures which we need, but I'm afraid we're not going to get, uh, are first of all, contact tracing. As Dr. Dr. Nuzzo emphasized, it is very resource and personnel intensive. Uh, it can be experienced as intrusive. I'd like to see it, but I don't think we're I don't think we're going to get it except in selected spots that are really committed to it, like Massachusetts, which is pretty far ahead of the rest of the nation. Finally, uh, Asian nations have experienced a lot of success with mandatory quarantines. Once again, I think a, a lot of Americans are going to bridle for reasons good and bad, understandable and not so understandable about, about that kind of measure. Uh, but at the very least, we ought to offer people voluntary quarantine options, making use of structures such as our mostly empty hotels in this country, and there are many of them, in order to give them a place to go because they want to do the right thing. They don't want to infect the rest of their families, and they ought to have an option. And this is particularly true for people who are living packed together in very dense quarters. We don't give them an option. They won't have one. Great comments, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, a good, complex answer. Thank you. Uh, David, in uh, the Hutchins Center, what are you all thinking in terms of the research and what it shows? Well, I'm thinking I'd rather go before Bill Galston than after Bill Galston the next time. Uh, that was such a terrific list. I think that uh, we look a lot at what's going on with the economy, and I think it's quite unusual moment where in the past we have sometimes been reluctant to bail out banks because they caused a big problem in 2008 and 2009, or to discourage people from working because we thought that without, with incentives, they'd go to work. This is just extraordinary and different, where we have, in the interests of public health, instructed businesses to shut down, factories to close, workers to stay home, ball games and theaters and movie theaters to be suspended. And I think it's very important as we gradually reopen, whether we're ready or not, we are, that we not move too quickly to withdraw this support from the economy, or, or we will have not only an uptick in the coronavirus, but we'll have what some economists call the W-shaped recovery, where things will get better for a while and then they'll get worse. So economically, the most important thing is not to end the support for the economy prematurely because the implications will be devastating. Thank you, David. Ross, what are your thoughts, please, based on your research? 
Sure. Well, the, so the question is, how do we curb the continual co uh, loss of American lives? And fundamentally, to curb the loss of American lives from COVID-19, we have to control spread of the epidemic. There's no way around that. And in the absence of a vaccine or herd immunity, we will have to have some kind of containment policy. And the question is, what should that policy look like? And we've seen that the policies we've used so far of closing workplaces, of closing schools, of asking everyone to stay home are very costly. They're costly to our economy, but they're also increasingly costly to our health and to our society, the fabric of our society. Uh, and our work is really about what alternatives are out there. Uh, I'm more optimistic than I think Bill is about the possibility of adopting some of these successful strategies that are not just in Asia, but also in places like New Zealand and Australia that have a certain resemblance to the United States, where widespread testing and contact tracing has worked. Uh, and I think in order to deploy those kinds of strategies for the next phase here, we really need to emphasize three things. The first is there has to be enough capacity. We have to have enough tests. We have to have enough capacity to do contact tracing. The second is we have to have a coordinated plan to use those resources, which will inevitably be constrained. We'll never have all the tests we want. We'll never have all the capacity we want. So we have to have a plan to use it efficiently and in a very focused, targeted, clever way. And the third, which I alluded to earlier, is that fundamentally, when you conclude this chain of testing and contact tracing, what you'd like is to identify people who may be contagious to others and to isolate them through quarantine, through asking them to stay home when they're sick, as we do with other respiratory diseases like flu. And so we need an investment in how to make that more likely to actually happen for most Americans. And our work trying to model these what if questions, what would it take to actually deploy these strategies in the US underline the importance of adherence to quarantine. If too few people self quarantine when they're asked, none of these strategies have a chance of working. Uh, and I believe that actually all three of those things are within reach. They will require further investment to realize them, but I don't think we're that far off from where we, uh, we might need to be. I don't think these are crazy ideas. Uh, and I think given the alternatives, renewed academic, epidemic spread, mass social distancing, further damage to our economy, uh, such investments make all the sense in the world and they can't possibly cost as much as we've endured so far. Uh, and I think this is an important uh, avenue for policymakers throughout our country to pursue as, as quickly as they possibly can. Thank you, Ross. We'll come back to you in a moment be, to, to have you elaborate a bit more on the, on the trace model uh, because it's been very, very helpful in, in the formulation of policy. Um, Rashan, please, can you give us a, a sense of how your research has indicated how we get after this? Yeah, I mean, so obviously, I mean, I'm thinking about dealing with racial disparities in healthcare access. I think that becomes one of the main challenges because if we focus, and we've heard from, from our other colleagues, Bill mentioned the elderly. I mean, we could also talk about the prison population, but oftentimes when we center the most vulnerable, then all of a sudden we know that we are also focusing on everyone else. I think when it comes to Black Americans in particular, there is one key stat that came out of this that, is, that should be troubling to us all. That's the fact that black people are six times more likely than whites to be turned away from testing and treatment once they go to hospitals. So even after we've dealt with healthcare access, we see the healthcare quality is a problem. And so while a lot of people are talking about, you know, black people's behavior or even their blood and some other sort of things that don't necessarily um, come to fruition in, in actual research, nationally, we know that black people are about three times more likely to die from COVID-19. And in some cities and states across the United States represent about 80% of all the people who have died from COVID-19. We also know that Latinos have been disproportionately hit by COVID-19. I think Chicago and Illinois becomes a good place to look. So, I mean, I've written about why this gap exists and what we can do to reduce it. But I think what's key is that people really have to understand the structural conditions of our neighborhoods oftentimes undergird pre-existing health conditions that impact people and actually increase the likelihood of minorities being exposed, contracting, and dying from COVID-19. I think the other thing, of course, we know is that Black people, as, as Molly's research highlights, and Latinos are more likely to be part of the, of the essential workforce. Being a low-wage worker increases the barriers to social distancing, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And some of our colleagues, Makeda Henry Nicky and John Hudak, had a, a, a very fascinating piece in fixed gov, actually a couple of pieces, highlighting what's happening in Detroit. And as we know, Michigan has been hit extremely hard. And 
honestly, when it comes to the, the upcoming election, one thing that I really worry about and that I've noted is the way that COVID-19 might literally be killing off stable black voting blocks in battleground states in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina. And I think that's something that people haven't really been, been highlighting and talking about what it even looks like to lead up to a presidential elections. I think we also know that blacks are more likely to live in densely populated areas. They lack healthy food options and places to engage in physical activity. And then I think one of the main things is this. I think that race and racial inequality, and hopefully after what we've seen over the past couple of weeks, people know this, but it should unnerve us all. And while COVID-19 is an equal opportunity disease, our healthcare system is far from it. And currently we are dealing with two pandemics. We're dealing with COVID-19, but we are also dealing with the United States' original sin, which is racism and structural racism. And it's high time that the United States stop necessarily taking a colorblind approach to this pandemic and instead give us the opportunity to correct some of these racial health disparities by implementing a reopening plan that actually centers health equity. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. I would also, also ask you, Rashawn, when you come back to, uh, you touched on it just briefly. I don't think we've heard enough about what's going on in the prisons. Uh, and, and in the context of mass incarceration, which should concern every one of us, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that when we come back to you for the next question. Uh, and Molly, of course, uh, your great work again on essential employees. Could you give us a little bit from your specific research work? Sure. So like Rashawn, I'm, I'm really concerned about the big equity questions as we reopen and as we've have had workers these past three months working through this. And, and equity, by that I mean both race but also income. And there's a really stunning statistic. When we talk about reopening the economy and putting more workers back in the job, this is disproportionately going to impact low-wage workers. And that's because low-wage workers are six, six times less likely to be able to telework and work from home presumably in front of a computer than, than uh, high income workers. They're disproportionately the folks who've been laid off from jobs when restaurants and movie theaters and nail salons um, and shopping centers shut. It's those workers who lost their job. And when they go back to their jobs, those jobs have a lot of face-to-face -face contact. They're not like this moment where I'm sitting here by myself on my computer. So the nature of that work is high risk. But there are three factors that came up all the time in my interviews with low wage workers who were disproportionately workers of color, the folks I interviewed. Um, and these anecdotal experiences are all backed up in the data. And the first is this point that Rayshawn has done so much great work on, is the fact that there are much higher prevalence of these underlying health conditions that Bill discussed that are the most prone to, to kill people who get the disease, whether that's asthma or diabetes. Over and over, I heard from the workers I interviewed that they have those underlying health concerns or someone in their household does. And that was some of the biggest concern was not just the worker who might have diabetes and is worried about going to her job, but her granddaughter who lives with her. Um, so there was real concern about, and Rayshawn has shown all the different structural inequities that lead lower income and workers of color to be more prone to die of this disease. Um, the second was, is one that's not being talked about very much, but again came up frequently. The workers I interviewed were predominantly in cities in the mid-Atlantic, from Richmond to Baltimore to Philadelphia and DC. And many of those workers with the lowest wages don't have access to a car to get to work. And uh, one worker, Yvette, uh, Betty, who's a home health worker in Philadelphia, described how she feels getting on public transit at this time. She said, getting on a public bus during a pandemic is like getting on the bus with a loaded shotgun and not knowing who on that bus is gonna set it off. I talked to another home health worker in Philadelphia who takes five transfers to get to work for a job that pays her $9 an hour. It takes her almost three hours to get to work and she's risking her life. Well, I have access to a car, so I'm gonna to try to avoid public transit for the time being. Um, the other issue that came up, and, and Bill mentioned it as well as I think Rishon, was this issue of multi-generational housing. And that's a term that we might use, but like to, just to put it bluntly, low-wage workers cannot afford to live alone. That's the way we should be thinking about this. Um, Sabrina Hopps is a housekeeper in an ICU and an uh, acute care facility in DC. And she explained to me her low wages, she makes about $14 an hour in a very expensive city. She can't afford rent on her own. So she lives with her daughter, her son, and her granddaughter. And her son is a cancer survivor. She has diabetes. So there's all sorts of health risks. She said, look, if you raise my wages, I could live apart. Um, 
and I, you know, really horrible stories of these, you know, grandmothers with multiple, that has seven people in her household. She's the sole provider for it. They all live together. And the length she goes when she gets home to scrub herself down and try not to pass on this disease. Um, it's really terrifying. The other thing we linked to that is childcare. And I know, I think it was Bill who mentioned childcare. Um, lower wage workers can't afford the backup plans, the, the paying for a nanny when schools are shut. They're going to have to turn to family members, which is going to further increase the risk of disease transmission to, amongst lower income and communities of color. So I think this raises to me all sorts of terrifying questions around equity. I think, unfortunately, as we reopen, so many workers could potentially be put in an agonizing decision. Do I try to keep myself healthy, try to protect my kids from this virus, or do we survive financially? And I think a lot has to be done to, to build an equity. And, and I, what I was gonna say was very similar to Bill, something that I wrote about with my colleague Martha Ross in our essay for this series is, how do we think about expanding the safety net so those who are at most risk and the, those who have family members they live with cannot work, no matter what we do with safety, some of those at highest risk, are, it's just too much of a risk for them. And there has been some important steps taken. In fact, uh, the state of Texas has issued guidance to say that not only those with those high risk categories who are workers, but anyone who lives with other members in those high risk categories are eligible for unemployment. Uh, but there's still barriers. Even if you're eligible, can people get that letter from their doctor? Um, do they even know about it? The system has been really frustrating. So I think these equity considerations are extremely important. Thank you, Molly. Um, look, we, I'm going to use the power of the moderator to uh, pull five minutes off the Q&A uh, because I think the, the value of this conversation and the individual presentations and the benefit that we can all harvest from your incredible research, all of your research, is very important to the audience that, uh, that has tuned in today. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'll ask everyone to be as brief as you can. Uh, we're going to go till about uh, two zero. Uh, so about 15, about 3.20. Uh, uh, and so let me, uh, let me start with David, if I may. Uh, reopening the country is, uh, is of course, a, you know, a crucial part of revitalizing the society. Uh, in the United States, like the, the rest of the world, uh, uh, took an enormous economic downturn, the likes of which uh, we haven't seen in many respects since the Great Depression. And at the same time, there remains crucial needs uh, to continue social distancing measures to encourage people to maintain good hygiene. So David, how can we as policymakers or how can policymakers and leaders balance these two demands? We're talking about not the, the individual workers, but the policymakers and the leaders. How do they balance these demands to find the equilibrium between safeguarding people's lives and ensuring their livelihood? Thank you. David. Well, you're right, John, there is a trade-off. We're not gonna all stay home until we have a vaccine. And I hope we're not all gonna go back and resume the lives we had before COVID-19. So somewhere in the middle, we have to find a way to safely reopen. And I think that requires, in addition to the sorts of things that Ross talks about, testing and social distancing, it requires some trust in our leaders that they're giving us sound advice, scientifically based, not aiming at uh, the next election. Second, I think we have to be careful to as I said earlier, sustain the support for the economy, for businesses and workers who we've forced to the sidelines. And importantly, we have to make sure that the system is working so they actually get the, the aid that Congress has offered them. Shocking numbers of people are not able to get the unemployment insurance benefits to which they're entitled because their states have inadequate computer systems or have had deliberate policies to discourage people. Uh, 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 shortcomings of the of the food distribution system have made it hard for people to get food whose kids might have gotten uh, free or reduced lunch. And so there's all sorts of things in the administration of the benefits we have to care about. And third, um, as you said earlier, COVID-19 has exposed for everybody to see some of the inequities in our society and the police violence and what followed has reinforced that. So at the same time that we're addressing these short-term problems, it is important to figure out as we reopen the economy, how do we address these long-term problems that have been simmering but unaddressed for far too long? David, thanks very much. 
Ross, let me come to you if I could, please. You've done some tremendous work uh, on something that has been created called the trace model, uh, which offers policymakers very powerful analytical tools to create and assess uh, their containment policies. Uh, in your research uh, thus far, uh, what have you found to be the most effective policies? Uh, is there a one size that seems to fit all model or do different regions or different communities require different variants of that model? Great question. Thanks, John. Um, I think it's certainly likely that different regions or communities will want to tailor their containment policies to context because they have different starting points, different resources, and different demographics. I also think that there will be variance in the strategies that different communities use because we're in a situation of such high uncertainty about COVID-19 itself. As Dr. Nuzo reminded us at the beginning, there's lots of unsettled science. We don't know how just how many people uh, actually show no symptoms when they have COVID-19. We don't know how contagious people without symptoms might really be. We don't know why so few kids are getting COVID-19. And actually, I read the science as being quite unsettled still about who's really at risk. Uh, we hear a lot about people of a certain age category being at highest risk, but there's a lot of evidence that has to do with underlying conditions and the, the ways in which it depends on those underlying conditions are quite complicated and I think far from settled. Um, so given all that uncertainty, uh, a policymaker who's trying to devise a containment policy has to grapple with all of those factors that are not well understood and that certainly matter for how well containment can work. In addition to those, if you went to, if you went, if you as a policymaker go to actually implement a policy based on testing and tracing, you have to think about not only how many tests are needed specifically, but how accurate those tests need to be, who you give them to, uh, how much contact tracing capacity you need, how many people do you need to hire, and how do you need to train them to do that work, and how all of those answers probably depend on these things that I just listed that are so uncertain. So TRACE was actually uh, a model that we designed uh, to help policymakers grapple with that uncertainty and answer those very difficult questions in designing their own containment efforts. For those of you who are interested in looking at it, it's at www.brookings.edu slash trace, T-R-A-C-E. The good news from the work we've done with Trace so far is that we actually found quite a few policies that are robust to that uncertainty. That is, they work even in the very worst case scenarios that we looked at. And we actually looked at over uh, several million uh, different scenarios, over 10,000 different combinations of policies across a huge range of uncertainty about the underlying epidemiology. Uh, and we think these reliable policy options will work for most places. Uh, and those policy options need three things, three things I have mentioned several times so far, enough capacity for testing and contact tracing, a smart strategy to use those supplies. And we actually find that the way in which most testing is going on right now, which is to give priority to people with symptoms, is not the most effective way to use limited testing supplies. We actually advocate a set of different and slightly more complex strategies involving contact tracing, which you can read more about at our website on the Brookings website. Uh, and three, this idea that adherence is so central to success uh, with any of these policies and supporting Americans in being able to self-isolate when we, they need to. And I wanna stress that given the right mix of ingredients, our trace model shows that we can really, as Americans, aim not just to flatten the curve by pushing cases off into the future, which was very important and necessary and timely effort, but to actually really suppress COVID-19, to have a system whereby we can detect and promptly respond to small outbreaks as they occur, to keep explosive growth from occurring, and to do that indefinitely because as Dr. Nuzo reminded us, it may be some time before a vaccine comes along. And the strategies that TRACE puts forward can be deployed indefinitely to contain COVID-19, even while almost all of us go back to work and to school uh, and to our daily lives in ways that are important to the fabric of our society. Ross, listen, uh, on behalf of, uh, of your colleagues at Brookings and, and many, uh, policymakers and leaders who have either used TRACE or will use TRACE. I want to thank you for that research. Thanks. It is making a huge difference. And for those in the audience today, just as Ross just did, I invite you to go to the website, uh, which is forward slash trace at, at www.brookings.edu. 
Uh, so please, uh, please visit that site and it's great work, Ross, and we're all benefiting from it. So thank you. Okay. Rashawn, you have uh, written extensively on how COVID-19 has uh, affected the lives of Black Americans and the Black community. According to your work, you found that in every state where there are racial uh, data statistics, uh, Black Americans are more likely to contract the disease and tragically die from it as well. Um, in, your, in our newly released report, uh, you specifically point to the lack of access to quality health care as one of the reasons for that disparity. And so as the country continues uh, its recovery efforts, what would you recommend to policymakers and decision makers on ways that the United States can systematically approach the remedy of this uh, tragic situation? Yeah, General Allen, as you know, I mean, look, racially equitable health care access and quality is what we need moving forward. I mean, we have to get to capacity where we have the data to properly analyze what's going on as it relates to race, place, gender, age, and other factors related to pre-existing health conditions in order to paint a, an appropriate picture for what's going on. And I think tragically at this moment, the same way that we lack data on race to know about COVID-19, it's the same way that we lack data on police violence. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're seeing these two pandemics and what's happening in our streets across the country. I think in order to do it, I think there are a few things we could do. One big thing that I've been pushing, and we've seen this, what I'm about to say, adopted in New York by Governor Cuomo and Congressman Jeffries, which is to really leverage Black churches in this moment. My research has overwhelmingly shown, and some of this work I've done with uh, Dr. Abigail Sewell, as well as Dr. Keon Gilbert, that Black churches become key trustee sites, that people who attend Black Protestant churches are more likely to trust healthcare physicians. They are also more likely to utilize healthcare. Well, why would that be? Well, you instantly deal with, a, with a, a network issue. So part of the thing that we know is that Black people are less likely to access healthcare. They are also less likely to get high quality healthcare. Well, when you have a network node, say like a Black church, all of a sudden throughout that network, people say, these are the physicians to go to in our neighborhood. These are the places to seek treatment. Don't go to that place, go to this place. It's the same logic we use uh, based on which restaurant has the best food or which park has the best sort of playground for kids to play in. That black people do this same sort of process that churches, Latinos do as well. This has been implemented in the state of New York where they've allocated specific funding for churches to do testing and triage. I think that's something very important. We need to ramp this up. We also need to work with um, local organizations and key trustees in neighborhoods to ensure that Black people are included in clinical trials, that those clinical trials are implemented equitably. And in many regards, this really aligns with, with President Obama's uh, promise zones that he, that he was trying to push when he was in office. I think there are also a couple of additional things, though, because I think that's the big one dealing with testing. I think the other part is we need to ensure equity as it relates to PPP funding. One of the things we know from the first and second round is that Black, Latino, and women-owned small businesses were rejected from that funding, about 95% of them. When we have these businesses in neighborhoods where they already lack infrastructure, and then you further devoid them of opportunities to leverage their businesses and maintain their businesses and keep people employed, this was yet again a missed opportunity by the United States to create some equity, and we did the exact opposite. So I think the big framework is that when we've approached COVID-19, we've approached it from a colorblind perspective. And I assert that we need to take a, rate, uh, a health equity approach to COVID-19. And when it comes to prisons, which is something you asked me about, and we had an event a few weeks ago, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson gave opening remarks. I wrote a piece in Newsweek with Reverend Jesse Jackson and Dr. Todd Yeary from Rainbow Push. And one of the things that we highlighted in that piece are the disparities that we're seeing when it comes to incarceration. That about 20% of Ohio's COVID cases are in prison. When it comes to Arkansas, about 40% of the state. And when it comes to right here in Washington, DC, the DC jail, the DC Department of Corrections has a COVID rate that is 14 times higher than the DC population that is not in that jail. I mean, when we think about that, these disparities are so outlandish. I mean, it is difficult for us to even map them. And one of the things that I did was some analysis to look at what would it mean if the rate of COVID that we're seeing in prison was matched in the general population. What we would see is about 700,000 more people have COVID and about 50,000 more people die from COVID. 
And I think these are some of the disparities that we're seeing. So we need to ramp up the PPP funding. I think the conversation on prisons is continuing. In fact, uh, one of me and Molly's Rubenstein fellow cohort mates, Annalise Gover, is having an event on Friday. Uh, Senator Cory Booker is going to be here to give some remarks about how we think about prisons, how we think about helping people get um, access to work after prisons. And I think this is part of what it means to reimagine America is that we think about some of the forms of in inequalities that we simply accepted as not given facts, but instead things that we can actually change. And I think it starts with empowering people in local communities. Well, thank you. Reimagining America, that's the, count. that's the challenge and that's the key. Molly, let me ask you if I could, uh, uh, while well, COVID-19 has affected the lives of, of all Americans, every American, it's especially affected the lives as you have mapped it and as you've studied it of low income workers. Indeed, millions have filed for unemployment benefits just as the Congress is deliberating on a second stimulus package. Molly, do you think that these efforts are enough? And, and if not, what are the ways that the federal government can offer meaningful economic relief uh, to these uh, in these challenging times to this essential strata of our population that keeps us going? Yes, absolutely. I think the response so far has been very mixed. So there's been some good news and David highlighted a little bit of this. So in the CARES Act, Congress extended um, unemployment insurance in a few really important ways. To It expanded the, the types of workers who are eligible to those like gig workers who previously haven't really benefited from unemployment insurance. It extended for a longer time, so through the end of the year. And importantly, they added an additional $600 a week as sort of extra compensation. Um, and I think all of those measures are really important, but there are some challenges that were already raised. One is that uh, a lot, millions of workers who filed for unemployment and rightfully, did, rightfully um, uh, have the right to it have still not received it. Um, in fact, Bloomberg had a story today that upwards of a third of workers who filed claims haven't got their money. The second is that it's, it's limited. So those extra $600 a week are set to expire at the end of July. All of this unemployment could, could expire at the end of the year when we still expect to have a lot of unemployment. So those benefits should be extended, not on some arbitrary deadline because of politics, but based on the economic conditions. The other thing I just say is that it's not only the workers who are unemployed that the federal government should provide relief to, it's also those essential workers who carried on working. By one estimate by uh, New America, there are 13 million essential workers who earn less than $15 an hour, so less than a, a living wage. And I've interviewed a lot of those workers making $9 an hour, $11 an hour. They're really struggling to pay the bills too. And talk is cheap. Everyone has heralded these workers. Our legislators have heralded them, the administration. And while there's been some motions, nothing yet has been passed to give hazard pay, to raise the wages, particularly of the lower wage workers. Um, and even some of the employers who provided are starting to roll it back. So I see this as a major weakness. We are not standing with those workers who are disproportionately, especially those lower wage essential workers, are disproportionately black um, and workers of color. So we need, their lives matter, their safety matters, their work matters. Um, and I think this is a huge deficit that the federal government should respond to. Thank you, Molly. Very, very well put. Hope we're listening. Let me uh, come to Bill Galston, finally. Uh, Bill, you've been a keen observer over the years and certainly uh, during these last several months in, in, of crisis, crisis at various levels, a uh, keen observer of leadership. Uh, you've written about it, you talk about it frequently, um, and leadership during a time like this is magnified in crises, such as a global pandemic or what we're seeing in the streets today. In your essay, Bill, in the reopening uh, project, you talk about the need for restoring public confidence. Can you describe the tangible ways that you think that leaders who are observing this event today or who are going to read our work or just, just think about this, what leaders can do to turn around an absence of confidence and how we as citizens can support them uh, as well as hold them accountable, these leaders? Well, John, uh, we've reached the moment that I've dreaded since this uh, event was announced because uh, you know, you've spent all of your adult life in positions of leadership. And for me, the figure might be something like 10%. Uh, but for what it's worth, here is my five part manual for leaders to restore public confidence in times like this. Point one, from which all else follows, clear, consistent, incredible communication. You're allowed to change your mind, but not too often, and you'd better explain why. And what you say, 
what you say has to be in touch with realities that people on the front lines at the grassroots can touch and feel and see for themselves. Uh, there's no way they're going to believe the sky is green if they can see for themselves that is blue. Uh, point number two, tell the unvarnished truth no matter how tough the circumstances are. The all-time classic of this, of course, was Winston Churchill, who promised his people at the, you know, at the moment of maximum peril, nothing except blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Point three, take responsibility for what happens on your watch, the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. That means you don't shy away from doing the hard part of a job and shuck it off on subordinates. You do it yourself. You model that. And number two, you take responsibility for the bad things that happen on your watch. You know, here, let me, let me quote briefly from a piece of paper that Dwight Eisenhower prepared on the eve of the Normandy invasion. He literally prepared two envelopes, one for success, one for failure. And here's the failure message that he never had to deliver. And I quote, our, land, our landings have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops who did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to this attempt, it is mine alone. And I actually looked at the original piece of paper and the words mine alone are underlined in thick ink. Uh, point four, when there's fear, address it head on while at the same time doing your best to create a horizon of hope. You know, the all-time classic here is FDR's first inaugural. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's not always true. Right now, we have, we have fear to fear, but we also have an invisible virus to fear. Uh, but at the same time, reassure people that we will persevere to a successful conclusion, even if we don't know how long and hard the path is going to be. And finally, put current difficulties in a larger frame of ennobling public purposes, right? We don't just need to rescue America or recover America, we need to renew America. This should be framed as an opportunity to build it back better. Uh, the all-time classic here is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, you know, a charnel house of human slaughter. But Lincoln said, we hear highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Well, we need a rebirth of something and we need it desperately and leadership to restore public confidence means providing that framework of not only rescue but renewal. I'm sitting here transfixed listening to you. That was fantastic and I hope everybody was paying attention to that and taking notes and the nobility of Eisenhower's soaring words of accepting responsibility in failure is something that, that a lot of people ought to be paying attention to now. And heroic leadership is desperately needed in this country today. Heroic leadership and noble uh, conversation, nobility. Um, look, we, I, I failed our audience. We don't have enough time for questions. Let me do one thing though and ask every one of the panelists, which is just a couple of minutes, what one thing what one thing would you suggest to leaders and policymakers to try to deliver our people of America safely to the other end of this crisis? What one thing? Let me start with you, Molly, please. And, and let me just add, you, you may have already said it. Yeah. So good. Say it again. Put equity at the heart and safety first. Rashawn, please. Yeah, I, I did what Molly said. I, I think the one thing I failed to leave off is in states and local jurisdictions around the country, create a racial equity task force where you, there you bring go. the key actors to the table 
to help you make decisions that you don't know the answers to. Because as we know from Shirley Chisholm, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and someone's eating you, eating you for lunch. And for too long, the most marginalized among us have been on the menu, and that needs to change. Thank you, Rashawn. Ross, your thoughts, please. One thing. Uh, develop and deploy a coherent strategy to contain the epidemic and be transparent about why you're doing it, how it will work, so you build confidence in, in the populace that it will work. Terrific. Thank you. David, please. Remind us what we have in common rather than to emphasize what pulls us apart. Thank you. And Bill, one thing. Uh, what it, there we go. Sorry. Tell America specifically what it means to build it back better. Great. Thank you. Well, to my colleagues on the panel, I can't thank you enough, uh, not just for being on the panel today, but for the quality the depth and the passion. Of it. It's really making a difference. And it's reflected in the product that we've just put out on reopening of America and the world. But to the audience that tuned in today, uh, thank you for joining us. Your Brookings Institution is trying to make a difference and trying to help everyone to come through this pandemic whole, but also to try to imagine and envisage a better world at the far end of this crisis. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you to the panel members. And that concludes our session. Please be safe and please be well. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.